Okay. Welcome back. Last time we did an additional example with dynamic programming. And then from that example, I expanded it a little bit, right? We had capital and bonds in the example. And then I added money into the constraint for the problem I wanted you to work on your own. But I wasn't going to leave you hanging. I wasn't going to let you just work on that on your own and then not have any kind of an answer key or any sort of understanding as to what the solutions may or may not be. So here I thought, well, I'd give you guys the answers. So I'm going to solve the, the model out here, and then I want you to see if the solutions I get are like what you've got at home. Hopefully they're the same. It'd be great if they are. If they're not, then you know, walk through this video maybe a couple of times and see what you did wrong, where something went wrong, maybe where you know something went right, and try to figure it out from there. Um, and then, of course, if you know you haven't been able to figure it out, email me, and we'll set we'll set a meeting up, and I'll be happy to walk you through what wasn't done right. Um, try to fix some things for you. So, we had our utility function. We had seen this before. This is from the neoclassical growth model. And we have the constraint with capital, bonds, and money. Now, the Bellman equation is just V of KT, BT, and MT equals the natural log of CT plus beta times V of KT plus 1, BT plus 1, and MT plus 1. And we want to choose capital, bonds, and money. And we're choosing KT plus 1, BT plus 1, and MT plus 1. And we got to solve this out. Now... Unfortunately, if I were to take this Bellman equation and substitute all the stuff for consumption in there, it wouldn't even fit on the slide. So I didn't put that in there. Um, but when you're writing this out on your own, when you're you know writing your notes out at home, uh, plug that stuff in there for CT. So our Bellman equation, well, equation two, same as like what we had in the previous slide, and we've got our constraint. Um, now, like I said, I'm writing it out this way because... The whole equation with CT substituted in there wouldn't fit. So just write it out on your own with the constraint put in there for CT. And we're going to need three first order conditions. The first two are the same as what we had in the previous example. Like they'll be identical. It'll be the exact same thing. The last one is the new one though. All right. So our three first order conditions, what are they? Well, with respect to capital, it's this. The only thing that's changed between this and the previous example is there's one more argument in that V function, but it's one over CT times negative one plus beta times the partial of V of KT plus one, BT plus one, and MT plus one with respect to KT plus one, and that's equal to zero. This is the same thing as what we had in the previous example. Again, just with the M or the money in there, augmenting the argument in your function V. Okay, well, what about BT plus 1? It's the same thing as what we had in the previous setup. Again, just with the augmentation of MT plus 1 in the parentheses of, or the, you know, the arguments of V. And if you're like, whoa, why did that change? What changed there? Something looks different. Yeah, I kind of paused the video and went and fixed some things because I caught a mistake. Hey, when you catch mistakes, you fix them, and then you own up to them. So this is what we have for equation four. Right, Same thing as what we had for the first order condition for bonds in the previous example. It's just the only difference is that we've got mt and mt plus one augmenting the arguments of our function v. But, of course, when we solve out everything and we plug stuff in, you're going to see the first order conditions are actually identical. They're totally unchanged. And the Euler equations for capital and bonds will be unchanged. Cool. What's the last one? Well, the last one's with respect to mt plus 1. Not bt plus 1, as it was originally before I, again, paused the video, went back, fixed it, and then started playing it again. So this is the partial of V of KT, BT, and MT with respect to MT plus 1. And it's negative 1 plus the inflation rate over consumption plus beta times partial of V of KT plus 1, BT plus 1, and MT plus 1 with respect to MT plus 1, and that's equal to 0. So equations 3 and 4 you've seen before. Equation 5, well, you haven't. 
This is the first order condition for money. Well, all right, what do we got to do? Well, we need to know what these guys are, right? Those derivatives on the right-hand side of the equations, 3, 4, and 5. We need to know what those guys are, right? So we go back to our Bellman equation, and we take the derivative of the Bellman equation with respect to kt, bt, and mt, instead of kt plus 1, bt plus 1, and mt plus 1. So we get those derivatives, update the t subscripts in all of those by one period. So first, what do we do? Well, we get the one for capital. We've seen this one in two previous examples. We saw it in the neoclassical growth model, and then we saw it in the example from the previous lecture video. Cool. Well, that's the same, and it makes sense that it would be the same because, again, the constraint's linear. It's additively separable. So at the margin, regardless of what you put into that constraint, at the margin, your decision for capital is going to be the same. Cool. Update that one period. Hey, we've seen this before. That works. Nice and easy. All right, so we're going to hold on to that. Next, what do we do? Well, we got bonds. We got to do the thing for bonds. Well, it's the same as what we did in the previous example, because again, the constraint is linear. And at the margin, if you're making decisions for bonds, it's going to be independent of capital and money. So 1 over CT, update that. It's just 1 over CT plus 1. We're going to hold on to that too. We'll plug that in in a minute. So now we got to do money. So what are we going to do for money? Well, the derivative of V of KT, BT, and MT with respect to MT. All right, well, this is also CT, 1 over CT. Cool. Now, why is that? Why is it 1 over CT? Well, let's look at this constraint, right? With respect to MT plus 1, yeah, it's minus 1 plus the inflation rate. But MT is just its little lonesome MT right there. So just like with bonds, when we took the derivative of this with respect to BT, it was just 1. Same for money. Because it's, well, its leading coefficient is 1, its exponent is 1. So the derivative of that constraint with respect to mt is just 1. So it tells me its derivative is 1 over ct. Updated one period, it's 1 over ct plus 1. So what do we have? Well, I've got this for capital, this for bonds, this for money. Not bad. Yeah, really the only one that is even remotely tricky is just the one for capital, which you saw first. So, you know, you'll have seen that the most throughout the course. That one will, you know, if the number of times you do this, if your improvement on this stuff is a function of the number of times you do it, it's probably going to make sense that the, the most difficult one is the first one because you'll have done that most. And, well, you know, the other stuff's easy. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully it works. Math makes sense in my head, but it's also a Saturday afternoon-ish, and I'm absolutely exhausted from the week that I've had. So maybe it doesn't make sense. I don't know. We'll see. Okay, so what are we going to do? Well, we're going to take equations 10, 11, and 12, and we're going to substitute that in for those derivatives in our first order conditions. So for capital, I just get minus 1 over CT plus beta times 1 over CT plus 1 times the marginal product of capital less depreciation. That's equal to 0. For bonds, Negative 1 plus the real interest rate to the negative 1 over CT plus beta times 1 over CT plus 1 equals 0. For money, minus 1 plus the inflation rate over consumption plus beta times 1 over CT plus 1 equals 0. Right, well, I'm going to move the minus 1 over CT, minus 1 plus RT to the negative 1 over CT, and minus 1 plus pi T over CT to the other side of the equations. And that gives me equations 16, 17, and 18. And all I did was just add a little bit of stuff, right? Okay, well, we've seen equation 16, we've seen equation 17. And equation 18 doesn't look too terribly different, really, from equation 17, except there's just, you know, that, that minus 1 missing, and instead of the real interest rate, it's inflation. Okay, cool. So what are we going to do for equation 17 and 18? Well, probably multiply both sides by 1 plus the real interest rate, moves that over to the other side, of equation 17, and then divide both sides by 1 plus the inflation rate for equation 18. Okay. All right, well, cool. 
So equation 19 is my Euler equation for bonds, and equation 20 is my Euler equation for money. That's not too bad. So the three Euler equations I have are these guys right here. So you can see, yeah, you have to do more derivatives with the more arguments you have in there, which, you know, makes sense, because if you're optimizing with respect to all these different choice variables, you have to optimize with respect to each one, right? You have to find out what the optimal point is for each one. So three more derivatives, and then the three derivatives to get the the mismatch or the, the matching time subscript derivatives and your first order conditions to you know figure out what those are. Plug stuff in, then you get equations 21, 22, and 23 if you have capital, bonds, and money with the utility function that we've got. And that's not too terrible, actually. This is maybe not as bad as we thought it was going to be. So here's something cool, though, that I want to think over for a minute. Let's look at the Euler equations for capital and bonds. The Euler equation for capital is this, and for bonds, it's equation 25. Now, the interesting thing, 1 over CT is the same in equation 24 as it is in 25. Beta is the same in equation 24 as it is in equation 25. 1 over CT plus 1 is the same in equation 24 as it is in 25. So what does that imply about the pink stuff in equation 24 and the purple stuff in equation 25? Well, I'll tell you what, let's rewrite what's in the parentheses of the Euler equation for capital. It's going to be this, 1 plus that marginal product of capital minus depreciation. Okay, that... Wait a minute. I got 1 plus this thing in the parentheses here, and I got 1 plus this thing in the parentheses here. And if this stuff is all the same, what does that mean about what's in the parentheses? Doesn't that mean that they'd be equal? Huh. Let's think about this for a minute here. The parentheses in the Euler equation for capital is 1 plus alpha times at plus 1 times kt plus 1 to the alpha minus 1 minus delta. And for bonds, it's 1 plus the real interest rate. That tells us something kind of cool. It tells me that in equilibrium, the real rate of return on bonds is equal to the marginal product of capital less depreciation. So I can just set the real interest rate equal to that marginal product of capital less depreciation. And that will hold an equilibrium. Thus, in equilibrium, the agent's indifferent between buying an additional bond or an additional unit of capital. Now, what happens is say bonds have a higher return than capital. Well, what would you want to do? You'd buy more bonds and less capital, right? Because you would get a higher return if you bought more bonds. But as you do that, as you're buying more bonds, as everybody's buying more bonds, the return on bonds would fall and the return on capital would increase. And it would go on until we reach an equilibrium where the returns on bonds and capital are the same. And in equilibrium, well, the two are equal to each other. And the cool thing is this would also hold out in the steady state. Now, I'm not going to make you guys solve for the steady states for um, this model. Just take my word for it, that in the steady state, that would also hold. So, yeah, I think that's something kind of interesting. I think it's really interesting to think about. And it makes sense. The real interest rate's equal to the rate of return on capital. Hmm. Makes sense to me. So, um, yeah, that is the solution to the problem that we had earlier. I hope it helped. I hope what you guys did was the same as what I ended up doing, at least close to it. Um, if it's not, maybe walk through this again and, and see where you went wrong. And, you know, if you still can't quite figure it out, or you're still not quite getting this, let me know. Email me. Again, always, always, always happy to answer your emails. So, um, yeah, thank you for watching. And uh, enjoy the rest of your week.